I noticed the words in that second stanza of 133, and let this feeble body fail. This morning, Sister Patty asked me the question when I came in the kitchen, uh, how was your week? And I said, well, it's, it's the ups and downs. Well, I noticed the words of this song. It said, in hope of that immortal crown, I now the cross sustain and gladly wander up and down and smile at toil and pain. <laughs> so when I came across those words in that song, I thought, well, how appropriate. And then my mind went to the scripture uh, in Deuteronomy where Moses told the children of Israel that the land of Canaan would be a land of hills and valleys. And truly the land of Canaan is a land of hills and valleys. The gospel church, in, in living in the gospel church, it is a uh, time of ups and downs. It is a hills and valleys. And in our lives, as we live, there are times that we are in the valley and there's times that we are up on the mountain. But you know, you've got to go through the valley to get to the next mountain. We always have to keep that in mind that uh, when we're maybe going through a low place, maybe going through a season of uh, discouragement or brief times of uh, 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 disappointment or sorrow or whatever it might be, to know that we have to go through those things in order to enjoy and to appreciate the sweet things and the blessed things uh, and the times that we are truly uplifted and blessed um, by our Lord. My mind this morning, and has been, continued this week along the same line of the subject matter that I was on last Sunday. And so we're going to turn, Lord willing, here and go back to 1 Timothy in that second chapter. And there are some things that I want to, to get and to pick up there uh, in, second, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and particularly along the line of prayer and of course, as you remember the expression that was in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 there when the apostle exhorted uh, and commanded and told the church at Corinth of how that they should take care of the situation of discipline that was under consideration there in that context. And he gave them the expression when they were gathered together. In other words, when they came together in the church, when they were gathered together in the body of the church, they were to take care of this. When? When you are gathered together. He didn't say if you gather together. He said when you're gathered together. And uh, so it is an assumption there, uh, uh, a foregone conclusion of expression that they would be gathering and that they did gather and that they were to take care of this situation when they were gathered, when the church was together, when the church had come into this one, uh, one place of where the church deemed and had set aside to meet at that particular time, wherever it was, and that the body of the local church was gathered together. It would be in that context, it would be in that situation that they would take care of of what the apostle was talking to them about there. So uh, we appreciate that thought and uh, it, it certainly conveys unto us the necessity of the church coming together, of the church meeting together. The church is a called out people, a gospelly called. Now we understand the effectual call. When we speak of the effectual call, we're talking about the call that cannot be denied. We're talking about the call that cannot be rejected. We're talking about the call wherein as the elect of God, uh, when we are uh, for still in a state of dead and trespass and sin, that there came the effectual call. There came that long distance 
repentance call. There came that call by the Spirit. That's the called that is in the Roman letter there in chapter 8 of uh, his foreknow and predestinate and called, uh, justified, and glorified. Those five things there. That's in the context of that call. That's the call in regeneration. And when I say it's the long distance call, uh, I'm trying to express that it's not the local call. The gospel call is the local call. Amen. The gospel call uh, is that uh, right here on the shores of time uh, that God's uh, uh, people that already have the long distance call uh, then hear the local call of the gospel and heed that call and come. Amen. Come and take up their cross and follow the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ denying ourselves and becoming disciples of Christ. Learners, followers of Jesus to follow after him and to live together in the community of baptized believers. Amen. And to keep house in that particular locality. To keep the church, to keep that that the Lord has committed. Wherein in the gospel church is the ordinances. Amen. Of the church. And of the great blessings that God blesses his obedient children with. Uh, when we're obedient and in submission unto him in that gospel uh, sense. So uh, the, the body of the church has to have a designated place to come together. And wherever we, we read in the New Testament that there were gospelly called out communities of believers uh, met uh, in a house, in different folks' house, wherever uh, that is, that the church uh, has set aside the place, uh, publicized and uh, announced where the church will gather together. Now, we have an established, we have a regular place here, a regular meeting house for Macedonia Primitive Baptist Church. We have a regular time, uh, 1030 uh, on the first day of the week uh, that we are to come and be, be here and be in our place to begin uh, singing and praying uh, and thanksgiving in our heart to the Lord and to hear uh, and be anticipation and praying to hear the glorious gospel, to hear the scriptures uh, expand to hear the scriptures called upon, uh, to hear from God's uh, precious, precious word. So uh, we see that there was uh, uh, this uh, also a type of form, e even in the Old Testament, uh, a, a type of form before uh, uh, there was uh, anything uh, in more of an organized uh, type way uh, before God blessing and we have the scriptures concerning Abraham and Isaac and Jacob uh, and they're coming together and even in their time uh, that the heads of the family uh, the patriarchs of the family, they served as priests. Uh, uh, those that were engaged in the true worship of God Almighty and had been uh, taught and passed down uh, the teachings of God. Uh, they had their times of devotion and worship and led in their families. Then we see uh, as we move into the, the era of time of the children of Israel uh, and their uh, great deliverance and bringing forth and how that God gave Moses the pattern for the tabernacle uh, there on the mount and the tabernacle uh, form of worship was established and, and then uh, the temple uh, worship predicated upon uh, the same pattern and foundation uh, that of the tabernacle and uh, uh, to this uh, type uh, a formal type worship and gathering together uh, of God's people of the nation of Israel that come together uh, then we have Psalms 122 as we brought over that I was glad when they said unto me let us go into the house of the Lord my feet shall stand within thy gates oh 
Jerusalem. So what a blessed, I was glad, I was joyful uh, when uh, the understanding of being able to come together with the people of God and in a, a community way of believers, baptized believers, uh, that have heeded the gospel call uh, to worship the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now here in 1 Timothy chapter 2, you know the Apostle Paul, for his teaching on these things and along these lines and in other places where he wrote, he has been called in these modernistic days a male chauvinist. He has uh, uh, been called a lot of bad things by folks uh, that disagreed by him, with him. Uh, there are folks that says uh, that these scriptures are no longer uh, relevant. That, uh, uh, that Paul, the Apostle Paul uh, that he is talking about for that day and time. That, uh, that that was their culture. That that was their environment. Uh, brothers and sisters, I believe that the word of God is the most uh, uh, up to date writing that there is. Uh, I mean, I believe that the the scriptures are relevant. The scriptures are sufficient. The scripture, amen, the truth is for all times. The truth is for all times. And in this, uh, as, as we, and I'm not going to go back through the things that, uh, that we went over. And so uh, I, I'm going to move on down here to verse 8. Uh, actually, verse, verse 8 uh, will pick back up uh, with the leaving off of the thought that was in verse 2, uh, verse 1, 2, and 3. Okay, verse 1, 2, and 3. And then you get into a little bit different uh, variation of subject matter in verse 4, 5, and 6. Additional uh, information, if you please, which is great and wonderful. And we've preached on it. Uh, and you've heard it preached on. And th this is some wonderful uh, text. Uh, um, and, and then you hear the apostle say in verse 7, Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity or faith and truth. And then he goes back to that, to that principle. He goes back to what uh, the, the thoughts of introduction that, that came about here in the apostles' ex, ex, exhortations uh, to prayer. And uh, then he gives gives further information concerning this. He gives these instructions, if you please, of how this should be carried on in the church. I believe that the context of this is in the church. Now, we can pray anywhere, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments if the Lord uh, be our, our helper. But in the context, this is when the church is gathered together. This is the time that he's talking about of prayer in particular here. He said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. This is in the church. This is when the church amen is gathered together. Uh, and he says I will therefore that men. Now so many places in the scripture when you see the word men, it's, it's speaking of humanity or speaking of male and female. But I, I want to, you to understand this morning that if you investigate this real uh, closely and look at this uh, a little bit further, you'll understand that this meaning of men here is man. I will therefore that men... But he's speaking of man. He's speaking of male. This, this word that is translated men here from the Greek, uh, from the Greek word is male. It's in the male gender. When he says men here, he's speaking about a, a man. He's, he, he is speaking about the gender of man. He's talking about a brother in the church. Uh, this is plain to see and understand uh, when you go beyond just the surface. Uh, I will therefore that men, uh, and of course this is Jew and Gentile, but, it's, but it is men or a man, a uh, Jew or Gentile, uh, uh, that uh, should pray everywhere. This pray everywhere is speaking of a geographic, uh, a geographical location, a, 
in, in, a, in different locations. Uh, wherever a local gospel church is constituted and exists and is functioning in that capacity, the apostle is saying that among that body, when you come together, when the church is gathered together, the, the primary function, remember uh, I told you last Sunday when he said in, in the first verse, I exhort therefore that first of all, most of all, the, the most important thing, amen, when we're gathered together is prayer, an attitude of prayer, a focus on prayer. Uh, you see, if we're not praying, if we don't have a mindset of prayer, if we don't have a mindset of thanksgiving to God and appreciation to God and confessing our sins to God and laying ourselves bare in our hearts, our minds in prayer as we sing and then as we hear the preaching, as I said a lot of times I have made confession while preaching is going on in my heart to God where I have lacked where I have failed where I feel convicted as I'm hearing the preaching as I'm hearing the teaching of the scriptures, the Holy Spirit convicts my heart and I know he does yours for that is the one of the great functions, amen, of the Holy Ghost is to convict as we talked about, amen, some weeks ago, amen, about the operation, the work of the Holy Ghost in this era, in this time since the Lord Jesus Christ has went back to the glory world, amen. Amen. The Spirit of God, amen, woos and strives uh, and influences and convicts, amen, God's born again children uh, when we come under that uh, of uh, uh, the hearing of the gospel and through song, through the words of the singing and just gather together and the Spirit of the Lord is in the midst. Oh, I tell you, uh, the most important thing is for us uh, to have an attitude a prayer and a prayerful mind and if we'll do that the singing will be better the public praying will be better amen the preaching of the of the gospel the apostle paul he said pray for me brethren that the gospel will have free course he said pray for us brethren that we would be delivered amen from wicked and unreasonable men that have not faith pray for us brethren that a door of utterance will be open unto us. I tell you, every time I come into this stand, I need a door of utterance open. Uh, uh, the, the geographical place is here. Uh, the opportunity is here that you have availed and afforded me uh, to be able uh, to have this opportunity. So in that sense, a door has been opened. Uh, but I need the spiritual door, if you please. Amen. I need, amen, the door of utterance. Amen. A flow of free thought, amen, in thinking, uh, stirring by the Spirit of God and a bringing to remembrance of those things and able, amen, to move the things from in here to out here, amen, that God uh, would bless us to be able to do so. But you see, when it comes to the public praying, when it comes to speaking out, when the church is gathered together, only the brethren are to do that. Amen. Only the brethren are to do that. It's not that we it's not that we're, uh, have anything against, against sisters. It's, it's not uh, that we're trying to be ugly. It's what God's Word teaches. It's what God says. Uh, uh, Eve was deceived. Uh, there was deception involved there. Uh, uh, in that transgression, uh, Eve was deceived as the Scripture uh, teaches. Uh, the female is the weaker vessel. And I know that if there were those that heard me say that a woman is a weaker vessel, there would be all kind of arguments that would immediately spring up and spring out. And I know a lot of times that the women show great strength and praise God for it. I thank God a lot of times for the strength of Sister Marlene. Amen. But we have to go by what thus saith the word of God. And this is God's wisdom. 
It's above our wisdom. And, and if we can't dot every I and cross every T of the ifs, ands, and the buts concerning it, let God be the truth and every man a liar. And we should yield. And we do. We do in the old Baptist church. Amen. So far. Amen. Thank God. Amen. So far. And, uh, and, and thank the Lord. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I can't help what goes on, uh, you know, at, at, at the next Primitive Baptist Church or called Primitive Baptist or whatever. Amen. Our duty and our obligation, like I expressed last Sunday morning, is right here. This is where God holds us accountable for what goes on, brethren. Amen. God holds us accountable for what goes on here where our membership is. Amen. Where I am uh, to be uh, the, the, the leader, uh, the pastor, the tender uh, to the sheep and these deacon brethren uh, that God has placed uh, and blessed in this office. And I thank God for our deacon brethren. I thank God for all of you. I thank God for all of you brethren. I thank God for you sisters. I thank God amen, for all of these children. And oh, if we will, as long as we will strive to do what the Word of God teaches us, we'll be blessed of the Lord. But if we don't, we'll incur and we'll bring down on our own heads the judgment of the Lord. And we certainly don't want that in that context and in that sense. So it's very plain. And when you go on, as I've always said, of course the Word of God says it, and then my take on it, and uh, someone said, well, that don't mean very much. Well, I believe, I, I feel mighty good about it. Amen. When I looked at the text that says that no prophecy of the scriptures of any private interpretation, to me that means that scripture must interpret scripture. And if you'll look close, if you'll look above it, if you'll look below it, sometimes you have need the whole chapter, sometimes you need the whole epistle, sometimes you need the principle from the front of the book to the back of the book. Amen. But somewhere in God's Word, there's an expression, there's information, there's instruction that will help us with, with a place that we're having trouble with. We may just not have found it yet. Amen. But here it's very plain. Because when he gives this, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Then he goes right in. He said in verse 9, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and, and soberty, uh, not with uh, uh, braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh uh, women professing godliness with good works. Let the women uh, learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach or to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So here the scripture interprets itself and gives us the explanation and the understanding and he says, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. The apostle Paul is instructing. He is emphasizing that when we're coming to the church, that when we're gathered together in the body of the church, amen, that there should be prayer made. Now I'm so thankful the sisters, uh, you pray in your heart, you pray in your mind. Uh, and just like we brethren are pray, trying to pray in our heart and our mind, while another brother is called upon to form the words and, and to express the, uh, the thoughts. Uh, and uh, we say amen to it. Uh, if that's the sin and the thoughts of our heart uh, as we are uh, lifted up and, and praying uh, as he gave us here when we're when we, supplication is made uh, as I told you last Sunday that's praying for others uh, prayers that's prayers in general uh, intercessions uh, uh, and giving of thanks be made for all men all kinds of men in every circumstance and situation Jews and Gentiles now, let me give a little clarification for that. Let's turn, let's turn back when, it, when he's talking about uh, uh, and, and giving a thanks be made for all men. And then when he said, I will therefore that men pray everywhere. 
You know, there's a prophecy. And this is this is for everyone, but it's also for you Old Testament readers and like to read in the Old Testament. Here's your prophecy. Amen. That that what the Apostle Paul is talking about is fulfilling it. It's, it's coming to pass. He, he's talking about it. He's expressing it. It's coming to pass in the church. In, in this context. In the book of Malachi. In the book of Malachi. In chapter 1. And for the sake of time. I'm just going to read verse 11. And I'm not lifting it out of the context. You can go back and you read before it. And you read after it later. But uh, in this 11th verse he says, For from the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. And in every place, notice this now, and in every place incense shall be offered upon my name. Incense shall be offered upon my name. Now, I'm not going to go into a long discussion. Uh, you uh, Old Testament readers, you understand uh, here in, in this about the, the incense and the Old Testament environment and so forth. And uh, you understand about the high priest going in uh, and, and having uh, the means, the vehicle uh, through which uh, there was the, the smoke, the fog uh, that came forth there in the Holy of Holies. You know, uh, uh, the incense that was burned and so forth. Uh, uh, but here it's in a, it's in a symbolical way. Uh, it, it, is, it is in a, a, a way of expression. And in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name. Now, he's, he's not talking about uh, incense itself. Amen. As I said, this is symbolic in the church. We don't use incense as far as uh, uh, the natural. Natural, uh, uh, but there's a spiritual context, uh, amen, of incense, uh, uh, of the praise and the fruit of our lips, uh, 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 of our uh, uh, prayer and communication to God that goes up to Him as a sweet uh, smelling savor, as incense unto the Lord. Uh, when we pray in the right way and in the proper way as He's instructed us to pray, it smells good to the Lord, uh, amen. It is favored by the Lord. Uh, it is approved by the Lord. And here the prophet uh, said, and in every place, every place. What did the apostles Paul say back over here? I will therefore that men pray everywhere. That men pray everywhere. Among the Gentiles, the lands of the Gentiles, the geographical places among the Gentiles. <laughs> oh, in every place incense shall be offered unto my name and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, uh, saith the Lord of hosts. Here's a prophecy where God is, is speaking of a people. Remember Jesus said that, that he had sheep uh, that he must bring. Uh, that, was of, uh, that was not of the Jewish fold, but, but was of the Gentile fold, if you please. Uh, amen. That he has a people among the Gentiles. Uh, uh, the prophet spoke of a great light that would come to those that sit in darkness. Uh, amen. Amen. The Gentiles, uh, uh, those outside of the borders uh, uh, of Israel, uh, uh, they didn't have the life. They didn't have the understanding. Uh, they didn't have the emphasis uh, uh, of the outward uh, prophets and speaking concerning the law, uh, concerning uh, the commandments of God. Uh, this is what Paul was talking about in Romans the third chapter when he said, What advantage hath the Jew much in every way? For unto them was committed uh, the oracles, uh, amen, of God. Uh, unto them were committed the commandments of God. Uh, they had the prophets. They had the preaching. Uh, they had the exhortations, uh, amen, to the commandments of God. Uh, amen. The heathen, the Gentiles, uh, did not have this. Uh, now, they had the law of God, the born again ones uh, uh, of God's people among them. Uh, they had the law of God written in their hearts and their mind, but they did not have uh, uh, the outward form of religion and in worship of God and in instruction and in light and understanding. Oh, but the prophets prophesied of a time when that would change. Oh, when his law would even go into the aisles. <laughs> Amen. I tell you, it was just shortly, uh, a couple of decades 
uh, after the ascension of our Lord that uh, we understand from, uh, from several references. Uh, well, one particular reference of, of names in the scripture, uh, but also from, his, from history uh, that the law of God, amen, the, the gospel of Christ reached into the isles of Great Britain, amen, of Wales. It came into the isles. Uh, I believe that was in direct fulfillment uh, of the prophecy that was given forth. They that said in darkness... Uh, have seen a great light. They that sat in ignorance now see great understanding. <laughs> oh, you know, the Lord made it plain that he had people among other nations, even in the Old Testament. He said that there were many lepers in the days of Naaman, but there was one leper that, that was healed, and he was a Syrian. There were many widows, but Elijah was sent to the widow of Zarephath, where there the Lord had commanded Elijah to, to be fed and taken care of. And that would lead me into the next thought. But I need to finish up uh, right here with something else. And then, then we'll go back to that, the Lord willing. But uh, I'll, I want to bring in back over the New Testament in conjunction with this prophecy being fulfilled. With also the Lord making uh, what the Lord made reference in John chapter 4, starting with verse 19. This is some very familiar verses with uh, the Samaritan woman. The woman at the well. And, in ver and, we, and we don't have time to go through that narrative. But I want to start with verse 19 because there's a point down here that I want to bring to your attention and, and to show you something. He said, The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now listen close. I've read over this a lot of times. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain and you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Remember under the old economy with the nation of Israel, Jerusalem was the place. It, it was the place where people would come from to pray in a quote unquote special way for the lack of words. But notice, Jesus saith unto her, woman... Believe me, the hour cometh. It's not here yet, but it, it's coming. When's it going to come? It's coming after the Lord does his work, after the Lord gets through with his ministry, after the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. And then they are then loosed to preach Jesus as the Christ. You'll notice many times in the Gospels, before the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection, he, he would tell them not to tell things, right? Right? He'd tell them not to tell certain things. And uh, he'd, he'd say, you know, it, it's, not that, it's not time yet. Uh, and he was talking about the hour when he would go through his passion, when he would uh, go through uh, uh, that which he must suffer, uh, that that he must accomplish uh, of, his, of his death, and then of his resurrection, and then of his ascension back to the glory world, uh, and then the coming of the Holy Ghost, of the Spirit, of uh, uh, the launching forth of the gospel church, and, and uh, that ministry going forth, uh, and that church spreading forth from Jerusalem. You shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Talking about that known world. Those, those Roman territories where the Jews have been dispersed and scattered into. Alright, so, so the, the message, they would then be free after the ascension of the Lord and after they had received the power. And remember, the Lord had told them, told them apostles that there were some things that he would say to them, but they weren't able to receive them and, uh, at that time. But after they had the measure of the Spirit, the way that they would receive, uh, that they would be able to, and that the Spirit would bless them and bring these things and teach them in that apostolic way. And thank God the Spirit did that. And in unison and in harmony with the teachings of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when Jesus said, The hour cometh, when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. Was he saying uh, that there couldn't be a 
gospel church and no one wouldn't be able to, to worship in this mountain and there wouldn't be a gospel church and no one could worship at Jerusalem. No, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that there would not be confinement of places. That it would be in every place. <laughs> Amen. Just like the Apostle Paul said, I would that men would pray everywhere. And as Malachi uh, prophesied and said, in every place, thank God. Amen. That the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel church, has been dispersed from Jerusalem. And has uh, went abroad uh, and has traveled uh, out and about in many, many geographical places and thank God uh, we have in this geographical place uh, we have the church uh, known as Macedonia Primitive Baptist Church uh, and we uh, come together uh, in the church uh, and coming together in the church then we're authorized uh, amen, to do the things uh, that the word of God instructs uh, to be done in the church. Thank God for the local gospel church. Thank God. Praise the Lord for his great wisdom. For God's great wisdom of his great design. This is God's design. God is the, the master uh, oversight and providence. And uh, the, 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 con the very concept is in God. It came from God. And God the originator and God is the establisher and God is the builder if you please also in Zechariah and I won't turn there but there came the time that the Lord told him to take the son of the high priest and bring him and put make crowns gold and silver and put on his head and call him the branch he was a type he was a teaching a setting forth Amen. Of the Son of God showing forth uh, the one who said that, uh, that he shall build the temple. He shall sit on the throne of it. He shall bear the glory. Does that not sound like Matthew chapter 16? Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen. What is he saying there? He says I'll build it. I'll sit on the throne of it. I'll bear the glory. Amen. I'll bear it. That's what Ephesians 3 21 is talking about. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. World without end. Amen. Unto him, unto God the Father, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus our Lord. We worship. Amen. God our Father through our Lord Savior Jesus Christ you see sisters you have to cover over your head in the worship service you cover over your husband because you don't worship Christ you don't worship the father through your husband amen you cover him up you worship the father through the son through the Lord Jesus Christ you brethren you uncover your head your head is Christ. Amen. You don't cover your head. Your head is the Lord Jesus Christ. And you pray to God. You pray to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's one of the points that the Apostle Paul is making there uh, in, to the Corinthians. Now there are some other points that he's making there. Amen. But I'm not preaching about them points right now. Amen. I'm preaching on that point. Uh, it comes in good and it fits in good right there. Uh, we're worshiping Christ. He is bearing the glory to his Father. Uh, uh, the Heavenly Father is looking upon us through his Son, uh, the Lord Jesus. He's looking upon us as we endeavor to worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem uh, worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Sometimes folks get a little uh, shaky, but don't understand that expression there. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. 
Well, is Christ not our salvation? Was Christ not a Jew? How did Christ come into this world? He came through the lineage. Amen. He came, uh, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right on down through. Amen. King David, uh, Nathan. Amen. Being uh, in the line of uh, uh, Mary, because Christ, and from from Luke's gospel, because Christ is of the seed of the woman. Uh, yes, and through Joseph, uh, uh, of course, goes back through Solomon. And, and Solomon was the one that sat on the throne. Uh, he had the right to the heir, amen, of the throne. And uh, by Jesus being uh, Joseph's adopted uh, son, therefore Jesus Christ had all the rights and the privileges uh, through Joseph and back through that line to Solomon to sit on throne but through Mary and back through Naaman to David Christ is the seed of the woman he has no biological earthly father he has an adoptive father and by the way by the time the Lord's ministry started here on this earth you won't read anything about his adoptive father he's, he's not on the scene He's not on the scene. You'll read about the Lord's mother. You'll read about some of his siblings. Because we know that Mary and Joseph had children. Uh, Christ was her firstborn son. She is a virgin that conceived of the Holy Ghost and brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. But after that, in years to come, her and Joseph did have children. Now... Getting back to this, so, uh, you know, we know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But, now, but the hour cometh, and now is. All right, now is. We got a little bit of different of expression. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. I believe the true worshipers of God have always been, back from Adam right on down, those that worshiped in spirit and in truth. They worshiped in, in what truth that they had. Adam worshiped, taught his, taught Seth, taught Abel, taught Seth, taught Cain, but it didn't do any good because Cain was of that wicked one. That's another subject matter. But nevertheless, amen, we're instructed to teach and that we and, uh, teach the truth as it is in Christ Jesus and in the church particularly and in our devotion. We are to worship in spirit and in truth. But, the, but these things that we're talking about this morning is public worship. And certainly the sisters pray at home. Uh, pray in the closet. Let, just like we brethren pray at home. Pray in the closet. Pray in the car. We're talking about public worship. We're talking about when we come together in the church. That is what our emphasis is upon. Now, I had mentioned about Elijah. So let me turn back there to 1 Kings. First Kings chapter 17. Now, I want you to notice something here. This is where Elijah tells Ahab, There shall not be dew nor rain. Now, before I get into the point that I want there, let me give also you Old Testament readers another little something right here. On this expression, there shall not be dew nor rain. This was the way he, this was the words that he used. This is not by accident. This, it, it, it is not that Elijah just pulled them words out of thin air. These words have already been said before. Turn back with me to 1 Samuel 1 and 21. 1 Samuel.
1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 21, I believe it is. No, it's going to be, I'm sorry, it's going to be second, second Samuel chapter, chapter 1, verse 21. All right. This is when David learns of Saul's death. Now I'm in 2 Samuel. I said first, but I'm in 2. 2 Samuel chapter 1. This is when David learns and he is lamentating over Saul and Jonathan. All right. That's, this is the context of it. And David has been told about their death. All right. And in verse 21, he says, Ye mountains of Geboa, let there be no dew, neither let there be rain upon you, nor fields of offerings, for there the shield of the mighty is vitally or is defiled, it's cast away, defiled. Talking about the shield of Saul, as though he had not been anointed with oil. And of course, there are several more words of language that David uses. And, and to me, it's somewhat of a eulogy. I don't know if you've ever thought about it in that way, but it's sort of somewhat of a eulogy that David feels and he is expressing at the time of their death. Now, Saul's already been buried. There were some folks that, that spared him. David talks about that just right on over here just a little bit. But, but this is as a eulogy. This is as expression of words over uh, Saul and over Jonathan. And uh, as you go through here, go on down through here and read these words, he says some beautiful words about Jonathan. Oh, how, how great, beautiful those words are. But I wanted you to see that expression. Ye mountains of uh, uh, Gibola, let there be no dew, neither let there be rain upon you. You see, something uh, drastic has happened. Uh, Something terrible in, in, in David's estimation of it and in David's life uh, uh, has happened here. And, uh, and, and David's cry is, let there be no dew, let there be no rain upon Gabola. And this is in the sense that Elijah, this is under Ahab. And the nation is in great idolatry. Great idolatry. It's a very serious time in Israel's history. And so David's, uh, Elijah's words are the same as David. There shall be no dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Now let's get to the, now let's get to the point that's particularly in, in, in the subject matter. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, I'm in verse 2, continuing on there in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings. Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now I want you to notice those few little words. I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Here's the place. There is a particular place. There is a particular place where he would come to this place. No one else. He wouldn't be gathered together. There was no, else, no one with him. But he was to come to that place. That's the place that the Lord was instructing him to be. Because that was the providential place where the Lord had instructed the ravens to feed him there. I want to tell you in a spiritual application, brothers and sisters, uh, the gospel church, uh, the gather together of the people of God, uh, is the place where the Lord has instructed the gospel minister, the gospel teacher, to feed God's people. God is ordained preaching for the feeding of the sheep. The Apostle Peter, he, he said for the elders uh, there, he said, I exhort. He said, the elders which are among you, I exhort, whom I am also an elder. And he told them to feed the flock of God that was among them. 
Now, that was Peter's emphasis to feed the sheep. Why would it be his emphasis? Because the Lord told him that. Amen. Would he not be instructing the other elders to do what the Lord had told him to do? Certainly he would. The Lord had said to him, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And here the apostle Peter says to the elders, amen, those, amen, that are to feed uh, the sheep, amen, the congregation of the Lord, the sheep of the Lord's pasture, amen, to feed the gospel, to feed the instructions, the teaching of God's precious word to them. And just as God had commanded the ravens to feed Elijah by the brook Cherith. If Elijah had been anywhere else, he wouldn't have got fed. It was there. It was there at that brook. The Lord told him, the Lord said, get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself by the brook Cherith. The Lord told him where to go. The Lord told him that's where I've commanded the birds. That's where the birds are going to show up. You better be there. That's where the ravens are going to show up. I've commanded them to come to this brook. So Elijah, that's where you need to be. If you're going to get the bread and the meat. <laughs> and the Bible says, uh, sure enough, the bird showed up. And the ravens brought, in verse 6, him bread and flesh in the morning. And bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. He had the providential care. He had to come to the brook. He had to come to the place. Remember the text in Genesis 7 of Noah? Come behind thy house into the ark. <laughs> Amen. They had to come into the place of God's providential care. The place that God had, de had designed and designated and had Noah to build and God had blessed him with the ability and the strength and the help. Amen. To build that ark of protection and safety and he and his family there were saved by that they were saved by water <laughs> the very water that drowned it. everyone else floated the boat <laughs> amen and they were saved now these birds here's a miracle of God these are ravens these are ravenous birds these are flesh eating birds you know what the, the nature of them birds would be the nature of them birds would be to, de, to divide and to eat it themselves. That's what their nature would be. They were flesh-eating birds. But God overruled their very nature. Watch. <laughs> Amen. God has to bless. God has to come on the scene. God has to give the unction. God has to give the anointing for a man to truly to stand and to preach. Amen. With the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven that will feed the soul. Not just to, to instruct the mind. Yes, that's part of preaching. It's the instruction and to instruct the mind. To teach. Amen. God's people the information and the facts. If you please. But Brothers and sisters, it takes the Spirit of God, amen, to take and to feed it into your very soul to make it as a cold drink of water to a thirsty one, to take it as food and bless it to that one that is hungry. So even as God commanded the ravens to feed Elijah there at the brook, this is where God has commanded the God called preacher to feed the flock of God, to bring the bread, to bring the meat. <laughs> Amen. To bring the bread and the meat. That's what the Lord did. He furnished bread and meat. The Lord, He, he furnishes uh, the substance. Uh, he furnishes uh, uh, that which nourishes, uh, and, it's, and it does, and it happens uh, in the gospel uh, uh, the same way as He furnishes in the natural. Uh, it's in the spiritual context uh, that the Lord does the furnishing. So notice those little words uh, when the Lord says, I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. Now, if that was the only place, the Bible says, let everything be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. You just go down just a little bit further with this narrative here on the same page in my, in, in my particular um, book. Uh, you're going you're to find and understand that uh, the brook dried up. 
And when the brook dried up and the ravens quit coming, it was, it was time for uh, Elijah to move on. And the Lord had another place. The Lord had another geographical place that he was to be there. <laughs> Amen. He was to go down to Zarephath to this widow where she was uh, gathering some sticks together for her and her son to eat this last uh, meal. And then they were, they were going to eat this meal. And after they had eaten and gone in the strength of it, and when that had passed and their body uh, had winged away because of no food, the, he, she said that we may eat it and die. Oh, but I want to tell you, the providential oversight of God was was in focus and was and was at work and notice what uh, the lord said in verse 8 and 9 back up here after the lord, after there was, there'd been no rain in the land and the brook dries up and the birds quit coming and the word of the lord came unto him saying arise and get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon and dwell there and and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there. <laughs> I've commanded a widow woman there to sustain me. So here's another there. Here's another place. Uh, men ought everywhere to pray. Every geographical place. Every place where the church comes together. Every Every place where the body of the Lord Jesus Christ is and, and that we should lift up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Now you could go in and read a lot about the hands and the lifting them up in the Old Testament. I read of one of the Psalms that says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. Who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessings from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. It was customary, it was among the Jews in relation to their religious upbringing. In, in, in the natural sense uh, that they washed their hands and washed up to the elbows. And in prayer, they, the men, they lifted uh, their hands up unto the Lord. And here the apostle says to lift up holy hands. This represents purity of life. Here the apostle is, is compelling uh, the brethren of the church. When, you, when you're gathered together and you come in and you're praying. Uh, amen. You lift up holy hands. Uh, amen. You, it's purity of life. It's without wrath. Without dissimulation. Uh, without uh, uh, anger. Without... Uh, uh, biases and prejudices and, and grudges and those type things. You're, you're not to pray to God uh, with those things in the forefront of your mind, but putting them, those things aside, putting those things away, knowing that it's the mercy of God and that we're not worthy of the least of the blessings. We're not worthy of the least of God's great mercies toward us and I'm just going to go ahead and get this in and I know it's uh, it's 12 o'clock there but I may move on from this uh, not be back on it next week but I just want to get this in and I will have to skip a whole lot but you Bible readers you know where we're at but let me just get this in right here uh, at the very ending of it in 2nd Samuel chapter 12 where did David King David go when his son died, the son, that illegitimate child that he had by Bathsheba, when conceived out of wedlock. Bathsheba, Uriah's wife. And you Bible readers know the story. And how that Nathan the prophet confronted uh, David with his sin and so forth. And uh, the time came about then that uh, the child uh, was struck sick. And, and while this child was struck sick, uh, David lays upon the earth. Uh, he, he's, he, he doesn't wash himself. He doesn't anoint himself. He's in prayer begging for the life of this child. But then he comes to understand that the child dies. And when the child uh, dies, and I'll just read a few verses here, starting in verse 20 of 2 Samuel chapter 12. 
Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he came to his own house and when he required, they set bread before him and he did eat. I want you to notice in the time of calamity, in the time of trouble, in the time of death, in the time of a hardship. Oh, where did David go? Oh, he arose, he, he washed himself, he anointed himself, he went into the house of the Lord to worship. I've always said this, that problems and troubles and difficulties, no matter what you're going through in life, should not drive you from the assembly of the church. It, those things should drive you to the heart of the church. They should drive you, amen, to, 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 to come and to gather with the assembly of the people of God and to see it. If you can't do anything but see it, if, if you've got a blank stare, if, if, you, if you're so broken, if you're so hurting, just come into the environment of the gathered together of the saints and the company of the saints and the house of the Lord. Oh, into the place dedicated to his name, into the assembly where folks are gathered together. Remember the Bible talks about where they were meeting uh, together down on the bank of the river, a place uh, uh, where prayer was wont to be made. I tell you this morning, this is a place and we're gathered together and prayer is wont to be made. We desire to pray. We desire to, to lay ourselves out before the Lord. The Lord knows us all are naked and open before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The Lord knows us. I'm not perfect. I'm way from perfect. I have uh, uh, faults. I have failures. I certainly do. I confess uh, amen that I do because God knows that I do. Oh, but brothers and sisters, it's gathered together with the people of God and in the the way of worship and praying and singing and preaching that I get the most relief. Oh, that I get uh, the most feeling I've set free from the problems and cares if it's just for the time. <laughs> if it's just for a little while, it's worth it. It's worth it. And we need it. We need it just as the running deer of the heart runs from the onset of the hounds and its heart is beating and it's thirsting and it stops at the water brook to get a little water as my heart painteth as the heart the deer does at the water brook. So my heart painteth after thee, O Lord. Oh, that we would have a heart to paint after God. And I tell you the best place to have that is in the assembly of the saints. God bless you this morning is my prayer.